Good afternoon, folks. Hope everyone's having a wonderful Saturday. And here's another fun story about Dana Schwartz, the She-Hulk writer for Marvel Studios. And she continues to bash men because she's a horrible person. Now, if there's something wrong with men in general, I don't know what that is. I'm sure there's several things about individuals we can say who happen to be men are crappy. But in general, these sorts of opinions, misandry, misogyny, these are just stupid things to hold. It's very hard to describe people as such. But here's Dana, and she is constantly reminding us how much she hates men. And you could you could say that, oh, it's her philosophy, it's her opinion on feminism. I, I don't really care. She hates men. That's what it comes down to. So she recently put a post about, <laughs> or reposted rather, a picture of Nicole Kidman and Oscar the Grouch. This was at least 10 years ago when Nicole Kidman did a stint on Sesame Street. And I think this was a, a scene with uh, trying to introduce word of the day and, and Oscar being a grouch wouldn't uh, release the word of the day. So he had to be charmed by Nicole to finally give up the information. And Dana sees this and says, well, this is every straight relationship. And there's all kinds of wonderful responses saying every lesbian relationship or the two grouches on the left <laughs> or other such responses. So if you don't know who Dana Schwartz is, uh, aside from being a writer, she had some rather colorful opinions in general about people, about life. Uh, being a writer, she tries to juxtapose ideas in interesting ways. For example, uh, here's one about COVID-19 she recently took down. Um, COVID-19 is going to be like Rise of Skywalker. It, it's a nightmare. It's going to be a struggle. But then we're going to get to come out at the other side and pretend it never happened, which is actually an opinion I share about the movie. But uh, I didn't juxtapose that with the idea of the pandemic we're in. Not good form. Not the best form of comedy. you got to be sensitive to people's feelings that we're all being impacted by this, whether through the death of a loved one or just not being able to go out or be as sociable or have fun as much as we'd like. So, yeah, her she tends to run her mouth a lot. Not Not the best human when it comes to communicating. Let's just say that. In regards to the specific uh, Oscar the Grouch imagery, I always liked this one. This was also a response to her. Just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things. It's called a garbage can, not a garbage cannot. It's kind of a cool little Yoda euphemism, I guess. But uh, I, I do like the, uh, the sunglasses on Oscar there. Fantastic stuff. So never, never let someone put you down because you're always striving to do the best you can. So we can go through the wonderful other tweets she has gone through. I'm going to go through a few just because they're obnoxious and disgusting. And just goes to show you, just because you're a professional writer doesn't mean you're good at your job or you're a good person who can write well. Writing well is a universal skill. It's one of those things where if you learn to do it, it's outside of personality. Like, uh, like Alan Moore writing Watchmen. He may hate the people who read his books, but he knows how to write. So maybe Dana's good good at writing. I don't know. I don't really care. Let's see what her opinion is on writers in general. Obviously, we shouldn't ban all the books by white dudes. So it's like, what are you talking about? Why would you say that? I think it just shows how people are so furiously and desperately attached to the canon that they respond to a slightly hyperbolic point made in half jest with such vitriol. So obviously she was saying that we should ban all books from from white dudes. She's like, oh, no, no, I was just joking. It was all a jest. It's like, of course, of course you were, Dana. You always backpedal whenever someone says something critical of you and they're being as honest and objective as possible. Come on. No, high schoolers do not need to read Ernest Hemingway. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Ernest Hemingway is not for high school level. It could be if we uh, are reading better books before high school, but not everyone has to read Ernest Hemingway. I would think they read they should read some Ernest Hemingway, like their short stories. That's a great introduction to any writer. See their short stories, see how they write, and then move on to their novellas or their plays or their novels, if they have any. That's a great introduction. So while I would encourage people to read, I wouldn't say Ernest Hemingway is the best part of an English literature uh, class in high school. 
The sun will not fall from the sky if another generation of students don't fake their way through the sun also rises. Again, Ernest Hemingway is an acquired taste. It's like scotch. Uh, a lot of people love him. A lot of people dislike him. Uh, a lot of people like some of his books and hate some of his books. It really depends. I'm like that too. I, I'm like that with every author, really. Not every author hits it home. So it just, every taste may vary. But there are reasons why you read the great authors of America or the past 200 years or the past 1,000 years because they provide ideas that were the first, that they came first or they introduced elements that you didn't see before, like Edgar Allan Poe, like Arthur Conan Doyle, etc. Our ideas of what the important books are wasn't built in a vacuum. I agree. There's reasons why we have the important books. They were created back in a time when books by women and people of color were inherently thought of as lesser. It doesn't really matter what these people were thought of or who or what they were. It matters what they wrote. And the problem with a lot of female authors, not to say there's a problem in general with women writing, there's nothing wrong with that. The books they write are very specific and they're hard to get into. And that's why they're not introduced as soon as possible to the curriculum of grade school or high school. It's something you would read at a higher level. That's just the nature of their work. It's not easy to read. The gatekeepers were white men who were blessed in favor of their own perspective. Uh, yeah, I guess you could argue that. I wouldn't say no to that. But it has nothing to do with them being white men or men. It's because they're probably teachers or principals coming up with curriculums and going, okay, maybe we can't uh, teach Pride and Prejudice. A bit di difficult. Same with Shakespeare. You probably won't grasp a lot of Shakespeare in grade school, maybe high school. Maybe see a play with your, your high school class. That could, that could be cool. But a lot of this stuff is difficult. A lot of the Russians are difficult. Um, a lot of the playwrights are difficult. A lot of the poets are, different, are difficult. So it depends what's consumable and what's understood and what lesson you're trying to teach your kids. Like what, what are they going to get out of reading a Mary Shelley or a Virginia Woolf? You know, they have, they have to know about um, colonialism 100 or 200 years ago in England. Um, but depending, depending on the, the period piece and, and who the author is, of course. But as, again, it has nothing to do with the, the white man's supremacy or the author being male or female. That's kind of the beauty with writers. Well, some writers obviously were egotistical and had these sexist views. But when you actually look at the work, it doesn't really matter who it came from. We need to kill the Western canon. 26 writers, four women, none black. Again, this is not important. It doesn't matter what their backgrounds were, what their gender was, what part of the world they came from. It matters whether that piece was the best definition of a period piece. So um, maybe like uh, James Joyce, whether he's doing Finnegan's Wake, or whether he's doing Odysseus. Um, like those are big, big works. You can't just throw those around. Um, it, it's kind of strange. And there's there's hundreds, if not thousands, of, of female authors over the years. Again, I said Virginia Woolf was one. Um, Mary Shelley. Uh, but look at her stuff. Like there's Frankenstein, everyone knows Mary Shelley for. But they don't really know the rest of her stuff. Like Faulkner, they don't really know Faulkner. Um, the Last Man. You know, it, it's it's not easy reading. There's reasons why you don't just jump into Mary Shelley. The same reason you don't just jump into Agatha Christie. You you can't just say you can't just go from the chrysalids to uh, and then there were none. You you can't just do that. Those are totally different genres and and different writing styles and you know. It, I wish we could. I wish we could throw all kinds of books at kids these days. They're getting smarter, whether I like it or not, and books certainly help that. But you can't just introduce random things in a curriculum and expect kids to get it or young adults to get it. That's why we have entire genres called young adult fiction where it would appeal to the sensibilities of kids growing up. They may not have full adult uh, appreciation of the classics, like murder mysteries. It's kind of hard to jump into a Agatha Christie book that has dozens of variables that you have to keep track of to figure out who done it 
if you want to. You don't have to read them for that purpose, but that's what it allows you to do in some cases, to actually figure out who the murderer is. If, you're, if you could really track those, those variables, it's pretty tough. Some of her books are easier, but most of them are, are fairly uh, hard to get into until you match her, figure out her style and uh, expect how she writes. So uh, if, unless she's giving specific examples, like if, if uh, Dana gave us a specific book, you know what, everyone should read this by this author, like, like Frankenstein, I'd be like, yeah, I would totally agree. Frankenstein is one of those seminal works that brought forth the, the horror and dark uh, genres that we are getting nowadays, that we've gotten even in the 60s and 70s with pulp and, and noir, uh, these sorts of vibes and feelings of fantasy and science fiction. It's, it's good stuff. But again, it's how do you create a curriculum for everyone to get into and read and pass so, and she's not giving an example. The literary canon, is, as it exists, is racist and patriarchal, and it keeps reinforcing itself. Like, really, 2020, we have teachers nowadays making curriculums that are patriarchal and racist. I don't think so. I really don't. There are plenty of authors of various denominations, whether they're uh, people of color, different countries, men, women, makes no difference. You know what? Screw it. No novels by white men in high schools for the next 20 years. And that's what she said in November 1st, 2019. And uh, did she backtrack? Yeah. Yeah. So she backtracked on the, the day after. So there we go. That's That was the, this was the tweet that made her come across as a moron for saying something as stupid as that. Okay. Okay. Deep breaths. Let's go through this slowly, because the film is, I guess, as you say, exclusively for men. Sure, men need to be protected from the horror of a woman who is 60 years old. So where does that leave us? And she's talking about the movie Top Gun. I don't know what she's meaning, referring to the, the horror of a woman who is 60, unless there's some sort of character in that story. But there are stories by men for men. Same with by women for women. You have the entire harlequin romance, which women eat up. I don't know why they do. Again, I'm not a I'm not a woman. Can't tell you why. I have some good insights, but I can't I can't crack the code. <laughs> I don't know all the reasons. So if you're arguing that this is bad because men can't deal with a 60-year-old woman, I, I don't know where that's coming from. From a movie, at least. A very uh, quick experience at theater, as opposed to a book or a comic. Do you see how objectifying that is? Men can get fat and bald and age, but since women are not people, again, no one's saying this, merely objects to bolster a male aim fantasy, no one's saying this, if they're not desirable, they are literally worthless or worse than worthless because they ruin the fantasy. Uh, I wouldn't say that's a fantasy. This is an opinion several men can have. They look at a woman and they go, are, am I attracted to you? Yes or no? If they're not, they're worthless. Guess what, Dana? That's everything in life. If I look at something and go, I have no aesthetic value, I cannot derive the quality from this object, it's worthless to me. It's not to mean I, I suddenly disregard them or, or a woman as, a, as not a person or I don't see them as a person. I'm just not seeing as something I'm interested or attracted to, which is completely natural. There is nothing wrong with saying I'm attracted to this for reasons and I'm unattracted to that for reasons. Nothing wrong with that. So while it is rather harsh that people have this opinion, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. And plus, it's not some minimalist view of people or men or women being attracted to each other. Men and women are just as harsh against each other. I don't think it just works one way. I think women are just as harsh on men. So I don't see the big deal, especially if she's showing pictures of Oscar the Grouch. You know, so I, I this is kind of a hypocritical thing for her to have an opinion about. But, eh, you know, Dana... And she'll repeat herself again, okay. Most men aren't aware of the energy, time, and money 
that women are forced to spend. No one's forcing a woman to do anything, darling. You don't have to put on makeup. You don't have to put on feminine clothes. You don't have to do your hair up. You don't have to do anything. You make that choice. You choose to put on makeup and a dress and and do your hair a certain way and put on earrings and pierce your ears and, and jewelry and what have you. That's all on you, darling. No one's telling you to do that. Especially as the age in order to be palatable to a society built around male expectations. Absolute nonsense. There are all kinds of women without makeup, without fancy this or that, that are respectable, beautiful, and gorgeous, whether it's genetics or whether it's a personality. There's plenty of women I've loved over the years for various reasons in various contexts of various ages. This is natural. You are attracted to people for many, many reasons. The, the, the friendliness of a neighbor, the, uh, the kindness of an old grandmother or grandfather, these are all good things. There are reasons why we like them. So for her to whine about, you don't know what women have to go through to, to look good, or, or, to, or to act, it's like, what do you think men have to do? <laughs> the amount of effort men have to do to attract a woman is several times more difficult. And what, a, what does a woman have to do? Look good. Guess what, women? Don't eat so much. Exercise a little bit. Get some... Get, you don't even have to fashion your hair. Just grow your hair long. Um, put on some respectable makeup. Don't go over the top or not at all. And that's it. You're good. You'll just have a nice personality. You've, you've attracted 99% of all the men out there. Bravo. Men, men have a, a mountain to climb. They have to do so much to attract a woman, getting a good job, uh, living by, on your own, getting a good house, getting a good car, uh, having lots of assets, uh, looking good, being athletic, shaving, all, all the, the normal things that people do in the morning, uh, smelling nice, having nice shoes, uh, liking the right foods, liking the right media, having the same tastes having the same political views, et cetera. Et cetera. You just go, go down the list. Women have lists because that's what women are. They are the ones holding the gold. They're the ones who call the shots because they are the most desirable. There's lots of men going after desirable women and women have to have standards. So it is the man's job in this sort of reality to appease the ladies, to show them we are of high quality. And sometimes we don't, sometimes we don't have it, or sometimes we fake it. But it's a heck of a lot more work for men to appease women. That's, that's why men do all the, that's why there's, there's singles bars, men approach women. It's never the other way around unless you happen to go to Europe or maybe Montreal, where the, sometimes the reverse happens, which is very strange. And if you've never had that happen to you, I recommend it because it's very, it's an eye-opener. When you find women coming on to men um, and they're beautiful and gorgeous and friendly and nice and they're raised well, uh, wow, just woo. Definitely not like Dana. <laughs> also, white men should be banned from teaching literature until 15 women win the Nobel Prize for Literature in a row. Okay, now she's just being retarded. Now, now she's just, you know how feminists make all sorts of stupid statements like Anita Sarkeesian, pretty much everything out of her mouth is a stupid statement or an insane statement. This is Dana's. She's crossed the line into insane boundaries all because she's feeling depressed by the white men of the world who are writers who might win a Nobel Prize for writing. It's, it's silly. A note to all men. Please never give me advice on how to punch up my tweets. I don't know what that means. Honestly, so much of Twitter is men commenting on my jokes with less funny versions of the same joke. Ha ha, I find my jokes funnier than you, men, because you're men. Ha ha. Wow, Dana, real, real, real mature there. Dana Schwartz. Look, am I saying we should ban all men from writing? Wait, yeah, I am saying that actually. So here she wants to ban men 
for writing. Here we have two greats. If you don't know Murakami and Frey, uh, they're not my tastes, but they are legends in their own right. I read a few Murakami books. Uh, again, not my taste, but he's probably the most famous author in Japan right now, living author. And to like, imagine these were two women, she wouldn't have a problem just because they are women. Because she's feeling women aren't presented well. You know what, Dana? Maybe they aren't, but all you got to do is write that great American novel or whatever and prove us wrong. You are an author. You, it doesn't matter whether you're writing a comic book or this or that. I don't care. Give me something which is gold and you will get that recognition. But I have a, a humbling feeling that throughout all your tweets, you're not spending the time writing gold and instead you're writing garbage. If this is coming off your off your 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 smartphone, you might want to spend more time in the study with your typewriter and less time on the on the Twitter. If if you are bashing these guys who are prolific in their works. She also claims that insecure needy men who think women belong to them are the real villain of the internet. Okay. My favorite thing about Ralph breaks the internet is that it figured out who the real villain of the internet is, insecure needy men who think women belong to them. I haven't seen this movie, um, but clearly Dana has a very warped view. If she thinks that's the message of a kid's animated flick for, and there's some adult comedy in there as well. If she thinks that's the message of the movie, that's, that's telling, that's sad, but it's also telling more of Dana. If that's what you pick up, this is this kind of nonsense we get from Anita Sarkeesian. You know, she sees sexism everywhere because not because it's actually there, but because that's what she's projecting. Women have to flay themselves open and bear all of their trauma and vulnerability in public just so we can beg men to care the slightest bit. I don't think so. Why? Why you, It sounds like Dana is not going on very good dates. Or her husband, I don't even know if she's married, or her significant other doesn't give a shit. That's what it sounds like, Dana. If women start crying in public about their feelings... There's something wrong with that woman, not because she wants attention from men. I can guarantee you that. If women want attention from men, it's really not that hard. As I said, go to Montreal. The women there are very open and they will get your attention in a variety of ways. So maybe the North American or American style women haven't figured out how to attract males yet. I don't know. <laughs> not, not a hard equation to crack there, Dana, but uh, you'll get it, I'm sure. I'm sure your writing will reflect, reflect that very very naturally. Some of the worst men, I've, of course, the worst men, all of them are bad, but there's like the worst, so there's like bad, worst, to worst, horrible, horrific. It's all bad to Dana. Some of the worst men I've ever encountered are nerds who didn't get girls when they were younger, then became successful, and now see them as commodities they're entitled to. Okay, so she thinks uh, teenagers who were geeks, you know, they weren't attractive enough to women, fine. Then the tech revolution came, they became millionaire IT gurus or whatever. And then some of these guys see women as commodities, which is a very business-oriented approach when you're a, uh, an IT giant or whatever, you have your own company. I've never met people like that. I'm sure they're, they're possibly out there, like they're called people who look at women as trophy wives or trophy girlfriends. Um, that's called the dating scene, as far as I know. People go out and try to show off uh, who their significant other is or who they're dating. It's a very juvenile way of thinking. And I think people who have successful businesses or, or just successful in general have already matured past that. I'm not saying everyone does this, but if people are in charge of business, they have matured as a result of that. So they don't treat people as commodities. You could be a, a really hardcore calculus sort of fellow and look at the, the dating game as just a series of pluses and minuses. 
like hedonic calculus, if you want to go through the, the animalistic view of nature, you can certainly do that. But that doesn't mean that's what people do. That's more of a an academic way of looking at things. And yes, there are people who, who could do that, but it's, you know, you say hedonic calculus to the average person, they're not going to know what the hell you're talking about. So probably not. Probably not, Dana. Big brain, probably not so much. <laughs> I believe I learn something from every relationship I'm in, usually that I have low self-esteem and bad taste in men. Y you know, Dana, I'm glad you mentioned the low self-esteem because the problem probably isn't with the men. The problem might be someone else in that relationship. And if it's not the man, I, I want you to deduce who that might be. It's not your cat and it's not your dog, all right? Not the man either. Just if, if you're counting the number of relationships you're going through, what's the most common variable? Just think about that for a moment. Anyway, that was rather fun because I find these people hilarious. Uh, these smug writers... Uh, I, I don't mind writers being smug or egotistical. It's when they show their disgusting biases about people and making jokes about, you know, COVID and, and all, these, this, all these ideological views that have no basis for rational discussion. That's what I find entertaining. Really crazy people who apparently are in the business and they're, they're getting a lot of leeway with their giant megaphone on Twitter or whatever, whatever. Makes me sad, makes me laugh, but that's life. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that rant. Have yourself a great day.